Yeah. We've been going around doing this brief. We've done it three, four times now. And we kind of revamped it earlier today. So now this is cool. It's a smaller, friendly audience where we can, you know, see how. Do you want a few hecklers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, we actually got a couple of hecklers yesterday down in Manatee, but. Um, really? Not real hecklers, just, well, why don't we just do this? <laughs> yeah. do, do we let them on? Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's yeah they tried to get arms to make it But um, <laughs> y'all know me. I'm Scott, 24 years in the Navy, uh, civics teacher, teacher of the year finalist, two time candidate. Y'all have supported me. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I'm not running for anything. I'm the president of the um, Democratic Public Education Caucus of Florida. And my goal now is to support other candidates, uh, especially uh, school board candidates across the state. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, um, I'm sorry. Can I add in? We have four school board offices up in this next election. Four. So just <coughs> keep keeping in the back of your heads for this next election cycle. And Stephanie can introduce herself. Um, see, when you get the brief introductions, and I feel like I also have to give a brief introduction, but I don't know everybody. Um, but anyway, I'm Stephanie Vanos. I, um, I'm the VP of the caucus and the chair of the political committee. Um, I am not a teacher. I don't have a background in education. So I just like to tell people a little bit how I got here. Who has food? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Okay. Pizza's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're good. No, it looks really good. <laughs> 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 um, so I grew up in a family that really stressed up in parts of public education. My mom was a public school teacher. Um, my dad really relied on public school to get education and who is growing up. Um, I went to public school K through 12, so did my sister and brother. We grew up in a suburb of Chicago. Um, I went to college at Northwestern and then decided that Lake Michigan winters were not for me, so made my way down to um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for law school. And I practiced law in Orlando for a couple of years. Um, when my second daughter was born, I had an opportunity to stay home, so I took it. Um, and now I have three daughters uh, in three different schools, one in high school, one in middle school, one in elementary school. And two of them are teenagers, so I will accept all of your well wishes. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, and really once my oldest daughter started kindergarten, I've just been involved um, working with school board members and community members on a variety of issues from recess to PE fields to screen time to testing to school start times. Um, I did the Orange County Public Schools Leadership Class in 2016 and 2017. Served on the Reapportionment Advisory Committee last year to redraw school board members on districts. Um, I've been involved with the League of Women Voters since 2016 and I've been the co-chair of the Education Committee for the League um, for the past two years in Orange County. Um, I joined the caucus about a year ago um, as a board member and um, headed up the Legislative um, Committee and the Candidate Campaign Committee. And um, so that's pretty much me. I'm, I'm an ex-lawyer mom who cares and is willing to do some work to make our schools better. Thank you. So next, click over. Um, click one more time. So the caucus, you've, I think I came and presented uh, on the caucus when Sean Shaw was sick and you couldn't come and talk to y'all. So uh, I don't have to say too much about that. We've been around about three, four years now, going on four years. COVID really hurt us organizationally, especially as a new caucus. Um, we do the advocacy bit, um, <coughs> we do the volunteer bit. And um, we did endorse and help some candidates um, in this last cycle. <coughs> and it's our experiences from this last cycle helping school board candidates that led to the creation of this brief and our plan for 24. Okay, so Hope, um, the political committee was formed 
um, just a couple of months ago in October. And um, it was in response really over the last six or seven months. Um, Scott and I have visited about a third of the counties in Florida. We've personally gone and met with the CEs and met with school board candidates. And just in talking to candidates and people, um, we realized that we, we needed to, to um, just give a little bit more attention to school board elections because they're really important for, for a lot of reasons. Um, so we formed the political committee, mainly focused on fundraising, um, and, and we had to do that because the caucus is limited to only spending $500 per year on electioneering. So that um, required us to start a political committee to be able to raise and spend more money to help our candidates. Um, and then we just intend to raise the funds to support um, school board candidate um, in really campaign incubation, voter education, small county program, and NPA targeting, which we'll talk about in a further slide. When you say political committee, is that a pack? Yeah. yeah. And is, is that going well for me? Yeah, I mean, we've just, we've really just started. Um, we've visited the villages in December, and so we're now just kind of making the rounds, letting people know what we're doing, what we're up to, um, and then we're working with some interns at UF, and they're helping us just gather information on what seats, what school board seats are up um, in 24, so that we can talk to school board members and start identifying where we need to recruit and find people. So, you know, current events, this is an overview. Uh, we don't want to get bogged down on current events, but we've got an underfunded public education system. We're like 48th in the country for, for funding public education. <laughs> okay, um, polarization, culture wars. I mean, you all know it's starting you know, or it became more apparent with COVID and then we had a horrible session where there were lots of anti-public education bills passed last year. Um, and then we had a governor who was injecting himself into school board races, which got really ugly. Yeah. Um, the new college and a lot of these bad school board members are just, like they get sworn in 45 minutes later, they fire the superintendent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, students are without teachers and counselors. So um, a lot of people talk about the teacher shortage or the counselor shortage, but we like to frame it, it it's the students who suffer, right? Because they have subs or they are dispersed or, you, you know, probably um, I'd say 15% of classes across the state don't have a qualified teacher in front of the students. Um, yeah. I mean, academic freedom, we've seen that with New Hope College and um, with University <coughs> Equity teachers are allowed to talk about in K-3 with their students. Um, so it's run the gamut. Um, can I, I'm sorry, add real quick, I'm sorry, I know so I'm interjecting. Yeah. But um, for example, AP African American History is offered now starting next year and our state is not recognizing it as an AP class. <laughs> so that is what we're looking at in terms of what it is to come. Go ahead. <laughs> so we have politicians monetizing our children for personal profit. Um, what we're going to see this session is something known as educational savings accounts, where if um, you get a parent to withdraw from the public school system, they will give you like $7,500 to spend on education. And the theory is then you go to private school or go to your... Um, uh, well, charter would still be public, um, but you go to private school, you go to your Catholic school or your, you, you know, whatever school. Yeah, we, we could delve into that, but that's $7,500 coming out of the, the, the system. And then the, um, the test and punish in our education system where we have kids who are, you know, taking a test and they're being, you know, held back in years based on, you know, held back in third grade if they don't score a certain score. Um, it's just so much emphasis is placed on, on previously what was one test and after last session we now have three tests that they're taking per year. So a lot of um, teachers, because they're also great, you know, they're also judged based on um, how students perform, so they're constantly testing kids to make sure that when the real test comes, they'll do okay, so that they will then be okay. So it's just a bad system. Next. Um, so why does it matter? 
okay? Like, why does it matter to anyone here? Well, if you're a parent, you're probably frustrated because all these new school board members are creating dysfunction, firing superintendents, and you're worried about your kid and, and their education because, like, that's what every parent wants for their child is a good education. Um, Moms for Liberty, on their t-shirts, um, they, they have a slogan, we don't co-parent with the government. Uh, well, we don't want to co-parent with Moms for Liberty. <laughs> yeah. He likes that one, he came up with that one, so. It's his favorite. Um, it's a good one. <laughs> um, okay, so our, our tagline is, public education today is our autonomy tomorrow. Um, and I also add that it's also our civic engagement of tomorrow, it's our democracy, and it's our communities of today and tomorrow. So it, it's, it's important at so many levels. Um, and school board members play a critical role in protecting our investment in public schools and our children. School board members are the ones who are determining what the curriculum is. They're determining how financial resources are allocated. Um, and then this year, um, in 2022, the silent, last year, I guess, <coughs> 2022, um, the silent majority was not heard. And so it was, we had a lot of school board members who were elected who were ex had really extreme positions and were supported by extreme groups and extreme people. Um, but the majority of people I don't uh, in our state don't believe that. And so we need to make sure that we are getting that silent majority to vote and getting them to understand how critical it is that they do vote for this thing. Okay, um, just click through and there'll be a whole bunch. So, um, this is like the key slide. Um, this is what we're doing, as this is our blueprint for the caucus and for the, the political committee. And number one, it's fundraiser. Like, um, our recently retired FDP chair, Manny Diaz, um, re released a, um, re re released a, uh, um, he, well, well, back on election day, he pointed out that in 2018, the last time it was a gubernatorial cycle, out, groups from outside of Florida, um, whether it was the Democratic Governors Association or the, the congressional committees, they put $58 million into Florida in 2018. In 2022, they put $1 million. So uh, every time someone said, well, all we hear is DeSantis, we don't hear Chris. Well, there wasn't money. And we need to fundraise early, like starting right now, which is why we're here, like two months, three months after the last election, um, to get some money. What we're gonna use it for, we'll talk about. One of the things we're gonna use it for <laughs> is a robust investment in campaign recruiting, training, and incubation. Um, this past um, this past cycle, we had, I think we determined about 100 seats that were- 100 or 150. 125 plus. Yeah, and, and that, um, you know, many that didn't have um, any, anyone cha any challengers. So we need to make sure that even in counties where maybe it might be less likely that school board candidates win, that they're out there sharing their message and, and um, helping to frame the, the message about public education that we want voters to understand. Um, and then training. Oh my gosh, we saw this so many times this past um, cycle with you know really good candidates who had no political experience, um, but they would have been great school board members. And they, you know, there was one candidate who got started late, he got started in June, and by September, he had developed into a great fundraiser. But he didn't start until June, so imagine if we had started him a couple of months early, he would have been able to build up those funds, make those connections with the donors. Um, there was another candidate who called me in October asking um, how to run a text campaign. So again, if she had been trained earlier and she knew how to start that earlier, she could have reached more voters. Um, and then in, um, the campaign information, just making sure that we get so the, sort of those early funds to candidates so they can get started right off the bat with what they need to do. Um, every time we talk to a candidate, the, the first question was always, do you have money? And, and then we would <laughs> explain, well, unfortunately, state law limits us to $500 total per year. So, no, we don't have money for you. 
And, and they're like, okay, well, what I really need and canvassing is the gold standard on how you connect with voters. Um, um, so um, we have formed a team um, and, and um, we, we, you know, I'm from the Navy, so uh, everything has to have a cool uh, nickname or abbreviation. So we have the specialized public education canvassing team ready and engaged. <laughs> and that spells out Spectre. So now, we have like the school, James yes. Bond, yeah. Um, and, and, and here, it, this is not gonna be for everyone, but we wanna find like maybe a team of 40 people statewide. But these are 40 people who are willing to, when, it, when it's campaign season, to drive to a, a couple hours. Hey, you wanna go to Brevard and knock doors? Sure, I'll drive across the state, knock doors for a day, and then go home. And if we could bring a team of really trained canvassers who know the messaging points, and they just need to know the candidate's bio, yeah, um, that would be great. And plus, you never know who you're going to run into. We canvassed in Brevard County this past year, and I knocked on the door of my daughter's yes. um, eighth grade counselor from school. I was like, oh, I know this name. I know his name. Um, okay, so get data systems to candidates early, get into the field early. And this part of the is uh, making sure they have money to get van access early so that they can target their voters and they can get their petitions, you know, get their petitions done early have a field plan, you know, and just understand how to get out there and connect with voters because that I think is something that was, was lacking for a lot of support candidates. Yeah, so, and, and we're, like, we're, you can tell we're trying to flip-flop and <coughs> I'm saying, man, we're, we're working it out and she'll throw it out is my point. But, um, hey, when I was a candidate for state rep, um, I don't know if I ever told the story, and we heard this from all the school board candidates, right? How do you make lists to go knock on doors or phone bank or send texting? You need vote builder. Well, a lot of these new candidates don't even know what vote builder is, right? But then someone tells them you gotta get vote builder and they're like, okay, who do I get it from? FDP, okay, FDP, I'm a candidate. I wanna go get people to vote for me and other Democrats. And they're like, sure, um, $800, oh, minimum. That's what it is now. Um, it depends on the size of your district. A anywhere between eight to fifteen hundred bucks for for the Democrats to give vote builder to the candidate. The candidate has to pay. Buy. Oh, they have to okay. buy it. Yes. Yeah, they have to buy it. So one of the things we want to do is our fundraising is going to go to help pay for that, so that they can get in the field early. Um, and we want to work with whoever the new FDP chair is and say, okay, can you give us a deal? We'll buy it for all the candidates, but don't charge us fifteen hundred. Charge us <laughs> seven fifty. Give us a two for one. I, I don't. Know. Um, Can I ask a question? What, what are we paying for? Program to have, have access to, to, to have access to have access to vote. Do they have it? No, not unless they pay for it. No, who the, 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 the big people have it. We all. Yes. We, yeah. Okay, so they have it. They just can't give it to you, right? They, 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 they could. They should. They should. That's, but they that's won't. what I don't understand. Why do they have to charge a, a person that doesn't have money to begin with? Money. Money. Million dollar question. Yeah. Oh, well. They'll give you a song and dance. Like, precinct cabins have it for free. Right. And, and, and we were actually using our vote builder access, plus, we had this great tool called Deck. And we were doing all sorts of things. And then a Democrat heard what we were doing, a Democrat, a good Democrat, and called me up and was like, I, I hear that you're helping candidates. You know, vote builder costs a thousand bucks and you're limited to camp campaign finance of $500 of electioneering. 
if you're giving lists to candidates, you're violating the state law and the election police are going to get you. But like, how, you, you know, who's going to know? Well, I found out. But like, that was almost like a threat. But I don't think it was meant like that. But that's why we were like, okay, political commitment. Um, anyway, NPAs. Who are the NPAs? I don't know. There's four million of them in Florida. Are they really Republicans or Democrats? Um, a lot of them are either Democrats who are sick of the Democratic Party, Republicans who are sick of the Republican Party, or people who are just sick of politics. Um, and then maybe there's a small part of um, of truly independent research make up my mind. But how do we know who's who? Craig Latimer met with us for Region 5 last week. He said a lot of the NPAs are Republican leaning. Right. Greg Latimer, this is of course for Hillsborough County only, right. but he would know. So for our county, a lot of the NPA, you shouldn't assume it's 50-50, it's not. Oh, I, I'm not saying it's 50-50, I'm saying some are D's, some are R's. And well, more of them are R's, according to Craig Latimer. Well, we did a texting to, I don't know how many thousands of them, so, so to try and determine some, who is who. Some people, so, so we didn't find this out until Leadership Blue July, mid-July, with the August election, right? School board races are nonpartisan. Right. And public education has broader support than a partisan race. We're like, hey, if you have data on NPAs, why weren't you sharing it with school board candidates? We didn't even know that effort was underway till we ran into Dave uh, Wax at the reception. And he told us about it. So what we want to do with some of the money we raise is instead of asking, do you approve of Governor DeSantis, say, you know, and we gotta come up and we actually have a national partner who wants to partner with us. Do you support public education? But it's gotta be a better question. Well, if we do send that text to 4 million NPAs, that's 80 grand for the first text. It's about two cents to set up a program and send the first text. So two cents times yeah, four million eighty grand. So yeah. Um, so we want to do that and have that data ready for the candidates because you, you know maybe some of those Republican leaning NPAs I'm leaning the wrong way but <laughs> might vote for an NPA race pro public education candidate, right? So it's a little different than what we were doing, but yeah. So the good news is that FTP did conduct some surveys to determine what messaging resonated with <coughs> people across Florida. And actually, good news, they, they tested a lot of um, different education messages, different parts of it, you know, related to different culture work, things that were going on. The bad news was they did not really release that information to the group until July at Leadership Blue, and the school board race was in August. So... Yeah, um, we want to engage in small counties with a Democratic voter registration advantage, or at least in some of these small counties. We looked it up. I think the notes are in there. Don't, don't tell me. Jefferson County, <coughs> site of a huge charter school scandal, had school board races. One of them was decided 467, scroll down in the notes section, 467 to 306. <laughs> the, like the total number of votes for that school board race was like 800 votes. Now here's why that matters. Not we could have, and, and that flipped a Democratic seat to a Republican seat, and that flipped the Jefferson County School Board from Democrat to Republican. If we did that backwards, then we control the school board. But there's a trickle down effect. There's something known as the Florida School Board Association. So um, they use taxpayer money to lobby the state legislature. So um, <clears throat> all these school districts, Palm Beach County, this is the one I know about because they talked about it at a meeting I was at. 
they took $25,000 of, of taxpayer money in the school district, paid for a membership in the Florida School Board Association, um, and then that school board association does a lot of lobbying. Well, the president of the school board association was a school board member, Republican from Lee County, who um, while visiting, I don't know why, while visiting schools in Palm Beach County, remarked that the reason why all the Guatemalan children who were in school in Palm Beach County were consistently late to class was because they'd never seen running water before, and they were fascinated with flushing the toilets. <laughs> so, here's the thing. Um, 426 races, all those uncontested seats, that means Republicans are in those seats, which means the Republicans are joining the Florida School Board Association, which means they're controlling the organization, and the organizational lobbying, which uses taxpayer money. So we, if we flip some of the small counties, we get more of our people in the association, we can change their outlook. Um, educated like the Democrats on public education issues. Um, so this came up because last session we um, were in Tallahassee and really kind of focused on just a couple of issues, but the, one of the main issues that we were focused on at the time that we went, which was early February, was um, the presidential searches and keeping those, um, for the university presidents, keeping those searches in the sunshine. Um, the, the bill was, which was ultimately passed, kind of took that process out of the sunshine so that a small group of people could make decisions about who a university, public university president would be, and then they would release the finalists. Um, I think the bill sponsor promised that you know three finalists would be released, and then the public could kind of vet them. And, um, but of course, we saw with the University of Florida that didn't happen. One finalist was released, and that happened with a couple of other um, universities in Florida as well. So anyway, we were um, talking to legislators about that, telling you know that was a, a bill that um, Democrats could have stopped because of the um, you know number of votes that it required, and. The never been, you know, senators that we talked to weren't familiar with it. They said no one has come and talked to us about this except for lobbyists on the other side. And so that's that's the information that they had. Um, when we would go and talk to them about some of the testing bills, they didn't really understand how testing worked in districts. And so they weren't, um, they just had no knowledge upon which to vote for a better system because they didn't understand the one that existed. Um, and there were a couple of other issues as well. So we just need to make sure that we're constantly electing uh, constantly educating elected Democrats and, and candidates, frankly, on, on what the issues are. Yeah, they're so overwhelmed, they believe the Republican talking points. This will cut testing. No, you tripled it. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, but we also have to educate Democrats. Like, I was at a South Shore Dem meeting before, like, the primary last year. And one of the Democrats in the room was like, yeah, I tell all my NPA friends that they can't vote uh, in the primary because <laughs> it's a closed primary system, which is true for partisan races, but not for <laughs> nonpartisan school board judges and uh, referendum. Um, and I'm like, ah, you know, you're a dam, and I, I talk about this every month at the meetings. NPAs don't know, so NPAs think I'm nonpartisan. I can't vote in the primary. We got to get them, tell them why it's critical for them to to vote in August. And it's always easier for Democrats to win in August than in November. Why do that way? Um, for for example, well, no, I don't want to get by now. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, robustly protect our candidates and volunteers from intimidation. Um, so I like to say that when you're when you're running for office, you don't expect to get love letters from your opponent. But the level of intimidation this year was was just beyond. Um, we had candidates. We had there was a candidate in Citrus County, for example. <coughs> she was in her 30s. She was a teacher. She filed to run for school board. Perfect candidate. Um, and a couple of days after she filed, a uh, pickup truck with a Club 45 sticker, Trump stickers, pulled up in her driveway while her kids were playing outside. Um, and in the front yard, and she was like, no, that's not, not, not doing it. There was a candidate in, in River County 
who also fought, who I think was contemplating filing or had filed. Her child was threatened um, or harassed on the school bus by the child of her opponent. Um, there was a candidate in Martin County who was running and the, the what was it? The GPS coordinates to her house were posted on Nextdoor and Facebook. And then four days later, she had a drone flying in her backyard while her husband was outside. Um, she also received a, um, an endorsement and um, some money from FDA, and it never showed up in her mailbox. So, mail, mail tampering may have happened. So, I say all of this because, you know, our, our, there are candidates who are afraid. They're afraid for their families. Um, they know that these attacks are out there. They know people are getting in their business, getting in their children's business, their spouses. And we, if we want to recruit good candidates, we need to make sure that they know that we're going to support them when this happens. And we're going to support them, whether that means being able to respond with, um, you know, mailers or ads of some sort, or being able to file a lawsuit. Like, they need to know that they're going to be protected. So, important part. And, and speaking of harassing the opponent, um, <laughs> we need to conduct opposition research. So, here's a couple of examples from the last, uh, last cycle. Pope County, Sarah Fortney, awesome school board member, first openly lesbian candidate ever elected. She was elected in 2018. She lost this year to a guy who owns a business and has a Facebook post, which he still hasn't taken down. I think it was a golf cart business. And he made some rude joke um, about, you know, he's like me where I like to make things that say Spectre. He, he kind of renamed his business um, and the, the acronym spelled out, um, well, T-I-T-S. And so, you know, he was like, our business wants to go big. Yeah, and it's still up there and they elected him. Um, in Brevard County, we had a great candidate, uh, Aaron Dunn. She lost to an employee uh, of the school district who was under investigation for two things. Number one, he lied on his application to the school district. You wanna know what question he lied on? Have you ever been arrested? <laughs> um, he was also the test coordinator and someone turned him in for backdating tests and they pulled a camera video that showed him taking the test into the teacher's lounge. Well, he got elected. Um, the, the local newspaper kind of ran it, but he got elected 45 minutes after you're sworn in with the other Moms for Liberty candidates. They fired the superintendent who was investigating him. Oh, great. The superintendent should have fired him first. So who did you buy that for him before he fired They had, well, they're, yeah. That, that's but, a whole no, separate no, that's issue, the, but that's the thing. yeah. But so, so, so we need, you, you know, but everyone asks, why didn't, why did people vote for him? Well, Aaron didn't have the money to get the word out to everyone. So this is a plan, but yeah, we need help. Next slide. So what can you do? Well, uh, and you guys know this, volunteer. So we're trying to set up local action networks. Um, we're trying to start chapters across the state, but then chapters require bylaws and a bank account and an EIN and eight people to be president, vice president, treasurer, board members. So we just want to set up local action networks. Join the caucus, we'll tag your county, anything, anytime we hear anything about your county, we'll email to everyone in your county. Um, you know, when people start filing to run, join a campaign help, join our canvassing group. Um, it's not for everyone, but if you want to get in the car in 2024 and drive around helping school board candidates, we'll, we'll show you how here in a second. Um, then the parties show up, and again, I know you all know this, but you know, attending school board meetings, and if, you know, just attending is enough. You don't have to go speak if you don't like to speak. Um, you know, <coughs> many school board can many school board members have shared with us that just knowing that there are people in the audience who support them and who are on their side um, gives them cover to, to do the right thing and not just have to cave to the you know people who are running up time and public comment speaking out craziness. Um, 
meet with your legislator at home or travel to Tallahassee. If you ever want to go to Tallahassee, let us know. Um, and then emails, letters to the editor, post on social media, all that stuff can be done at home. It's easy and it helps to spread the word. And we're going to have interns, um, some of the from UF. Well, I'm glad I'm not their age where I have to compete against them. They're very impressive. Um, they're going to help draft like draft letters to the editor where we can send them out to people and then you just put your name on them and, and submit them, reward them that way. Um, yeah. Um, you can run for office. They went up for that. And then I think there's one more click on this slide. Or you can donate to Hope. Money helps. It won't solve all of our problems, but it's your work. It's ours. Yeah. So, what are we going to do with the money? Um, Everything we talked about. Is there another one? Oh, sorry. Okay. Who's managing that money? Say again? Who's managing that money? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so, we set up the political committee. And um, Steph is the chair, and I am the treasurer. So Steph's got the checkbook and the, and the credit card. Um, but it's a partnership because it'll be the caucus, right? It's kind of, we're, 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 we're kind of the tag team. Hey, I'm the Democratic side. I'm the Democratic organization. But we can't do anything above 500 bucks because of state law. So here's the political committee side. But then it also gives us an opportunity, and we deliberately, um, and on advice of the FDP, didn't put Democrat into the name of the political committee so that we can operate in nonpartisan areas, right? Like if you say I'm a Democrat and you talk to a legal woman, like, like could I go talk to, um, the Riverview Women's Club as the president of the Democratic Public Education. No, Could Stephanie it. get in as help out public education? Yeah. So that's kind of the, you, you know, that's what we're working on, but we're starting out and, and I've kind of hit up Hillsborough um, so that we practice the stick and shtick and maybe get a little money. Um, if, if you have a smartphone, Take a picture. We need to put uh, make checks out. If you have a checkbook, make the check out to Hope, and and uh, we do business at the bank, region the bank by Hope. So everyone, point your camera. <laughs> get your checkbook out, please. I didn't bring it. You got to say it right No, we're Maybe not something. set up for that. <laughs> um, Okay, and, and we'll give all these links to Donna and Chris, and you can email the club maybe if Donna approves. Uh, next one. Um, we do have a weekly newsletter. It goes out most weeks on Tuesday. And, um, you, you know, I'll talk about what's going on. It has a call to action section, and it'll have legislative updates. Um, when it's candidate season, we'll let you know about candidates. We include um, you know, the latest news links, um, the educational <coughs> stories. We always put our messaging slides in there. So um, you have a weekly talking point, and then you've got the, all the talking points. Um, so if you sign up, one email a week. That's it. If that. You promise? I promise. You know what? I receive it, and it's once a week. Unless you don't open it. If you don't open it, you get it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. next slide. Do we? Are we supposed to swap out on these? I think we should, but. Okay. Go on. Can we, can we donate on the website? We can't donate to each. With your cards. Yes. Yes. For, 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 for so, 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 this is the caucus website. Oh, so we want to go to the one with the guilt. Next slide. So What's the, the whole website? website? So, so just kind of think of like the caucus website is more about messaging and legislative and advocacy, and then the hope website is more about the political side and helping candidates and campaigns. So that's where donations are. Yes. yes. Well, what yes. is the website? What is the actual website's yeah. name? It's hope. hope. I'm sorry. It's hope. 
Number four, and then fl.org. Four, Next slide. Thank you. If you want to be a caucus member, like, these are like switched. If you want to join, it's 20 bucks um, to join the caucus as a member, which I believe is cheaper than East Hillsborough. Hey, <laughs> hey Donna first, then, then support the women's club, and then, yeah. Uh, next slide. But then, then if you have leftovers, um, so if you want to be the canvasser, that's the sign up there. Takes you to a Google form. Next slide. Just in running for office? I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think that's it, right? That's it. No, Thank you.